welcome to the Public Safety Commission meeting for May 2022. Three. I mean, 23, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, or am I? The last three years. Um, so this is the Public Safety Commission meeting is called to order at uh, 7.01. And a quorum is present with Commissioner Cruz, Commissioner Neva, and Commissioner uh, Dickinson, sorry. Um, I need, let's see, we need to um, motion, we need a motion to approve the agenda. So the commission has received the proposed agenda. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay. Um, so the agenda will run as stated. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 So the uh, agenda moves. So approved minutes from the previous meeting. Is there, all the commissioners received the minutes. Um, and are there any corrections to the amendments? Okay. So those in favor of approving the minutes from the previous meeting, um, say aye. Aye. Okay, hearing no um, <clears throat> objections, the minutes are filed as presented. So we will move on to public input. Um, the public is invited to present petitions, make announcements, and provide other information to the commission uh, that is relevant to the scope of authority of the city of Blue Lake that is not on the agenda. The commission may provide up to 15 minutes for public input session to assure that each individual presentation is heard. The commission may uniformly impose time limits of three minutes to each individual presentation uh, the public will be given the opportunity to address items that are on the agenda at the time that the commission takes up each specific agenda item. So at this time, is there anybody here from the public that would like to speak on anything that is not an agenda item? Okay, and we'll move forward to um, uh, item number five, discuss and review the city of Blue Lake dog ordinance, including leash law options. So this was uh, it's been a, I guess the commission has asked the public safety committee, the city council, I'm sorry, has asked the public safety commission to review uh, the issues and um, come up with some recommendations to um, either changing or adopting a leash law or, or whatever um, is decided. So. <clears throat> Do you want to speak on this at all, Mandy, or? Um, yeah, so at the city council meeting, um, the last council meeting in April, uh, the council asked the uh, commission to look into options for a leash law um, in the city. We don't current, we do not currently have a leash law. Um, and I believe that our law is, uh, mirrors the county's law and that was probably written at the time uh, when the city changed over from having its own law enforcement and animal, animal control to contracting with the sheriff um, so i'm assuming that at that point they brought uh, probably the this part of the city's municipal code or ordinances into compliance with the sheriff's or the county's rules um, so that the sheriff's deputies would be enforcing um, the same the same types of rules and um, penalties. So I was just looking to see the what I have read um, is that a dog does not necessarily have to be on a leash, but it has to be in the control, voice control of its owner. Yeah, care, <clears throat> care and custody of control. Yeah. Um, which is problematic, right? Because every dog is control of their owner until they're not. So um, it doesn't seem like that's sufficient. Okay. And I, you know, I don't know where the, the community was at the time with this issue. Um, we have a lot of people that walk their dogs through the community that don't have them on leashes. Um, so I don't know what kind of what the thought process was, but it's something the council would like 
has asked if the, the commission would look into it. Um, I would recommend uh, looking to see if there are any other cities maybe um, of our size or that have some kind of law enforcement contract uh, for enforcement from maybe another agency um, that might be something that we could look at and, and see if it would be applicable to Blue Lake. Is there, are we trying to follow um, the like other ordinances or are we trying to sort of match other communities or what would be the rationale for that? Well, I think it's always helpful to look at what other cities do. One, it kind of gives you an opportunity to see it's a, a lot of times those uh, those ordinances have already been through a legal test. Uh, and so it does, it can save some time. You know, you don't need to recreate the wheel if there's something that looks good uh, that might be applicable. I mean, you can always make changes. Uh, obviously, anything you change has to go through uh, legal review. And I don't think that the council's asking you to go to that extreme to like develop an ordinance, but I think coming back to the recommendation uh, that they could then take to the next level. Try to find um, some best practices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that there's com there are communities out there that have leash laws. Um, let's see if this is. So, um, Can we form a subcommittee to, to work on this and do the research and work together on That would probably be the easiest way to do it, to just do an ad hoc. Okay. Anybody? Can we put a time frame around this? I know that it's of great interest to people. Is that possible to do? Yeah, you guys, it's up to you guys. You're the next council meeting? One month. One month. One month. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we could be ready by then. Yeah, I'm comfortable. Um, I think we should form a subcommittee because we can't do three people um, because of the Brown Act. So if a couple of us get together and work on this, um, on our, you know, over the next month and have and pull something together, uh, is anybody interested in being on the subcommittee? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll we'll have you two come up with something. Um, Can we meet outside to, to work on this, or does it have to be like a formal? Um, no, okay. no. You guys can. Okay. The whole point of okay. So you're not establishing a quorum. Okay. So you have more flexibility. Okay. So uh, I guess at this time we can um, take questions from the public on this subject. So, yeah. Is that why, Nona? So I apologize for those of you who are going to have to hear me repeat myself. This is, I think I've been going to meetings since December, so I probably repeat myself. So I'm going to start from the beginning because I know I haven't seen all of you before face to face. So um, on December 12th at 6:45, I awoke to um, my dog. Well, I had let my dog out to use the restroom, and when I came back to open the door, uh, it was 6:45 in the morning, and my dog was laying. He looked like he was dead and there was a giant pit bull standing over him. And so I ran out in my underwear and kicked the dog and yelled and um, proceeded to get my dog inside and start calling 911 because that's what I thought to do was to call 911. Um, it was really early, so of course I know, you know, 6.45 was very early. I waited until 9.10 um, or 9.15, I think my phone said, to get a hold of the city of Blue Lake to let them know the situation and that I just was not getting any responses from the sheriff. Um, at 9.45, Otis returned back to my house and was circling my house. And at that point, I contacted the uh, city again. And at that point, I was notified that Glenn would come get the dog. Minutes later, I saw Glenn driving by and I didn't see Otis anymore after that. Um, the rest of my day was just filled with the vet and uh, tracking down Chris Alvarez. I went to his trailer at the ground yard and spoke with him and showed him my dog, who I believe was going to die at that time. Um, I ended the day of feeling certain that the hands would die. At the event, we found out that he had a broken sternum. Uh, there was suspected um, internal bleeding that I needed imaging I couldn't afford. Um, I counted over 20 spots where he was chewed on, including his genitals, which were pulled out and exposed and scratched. 
Uh, he had shoes from head to tail. He was missing a strip around his neck of fur, bloody wound, and salt hole. He couldn't eat, walk, or drink. Um, it was around the clock fair, 24 hours. It was December, and I was walking down the road at 2, 3, 4 a.m. with my dog, carrying him, um, watching him convulse and pee on himself, and it was awful. Um, the next day, I woke up, and I started calling the sheriffs again. Uh, at 10.40, I called the city at there was an update from their end, and I was just told that I'd get a call back. Um, at that point, I drove to McKinleyville, and at the animal control uh, office, I was told by an officer that although we were both standing, literally looking at each other, she could not take my report. She said that she needed a call from the UA's manager. She said she herself may even be the officer assigned, but until the phone call came in, she couldn't help me, and her words, her hands were tied. So I immediately came home and I sent a Facebook message to Mandy because she and I had communicated via Facebook in the past. Uh, I was letting her know what I had just been told at the sheriff's office and I was getting frustrated at this point. Uh, when I, within a few minutes I was responded to and she let me know she had con been in contact with the sheriff and they would be getting a hold of me. Within 10 minutes I had a call from the sheriff. I was able to give a semi-detailed uh, account but I had to request avidly for a sheriff to come and photograph my dog and the evidence left in my yard. She agreed, but let me know she wouldn't be out that day. Um, so that night continued the seizures. Yeah, it was awful. Um, a lot of community outreach at that time and support, and it really showed just his great disposition. And he's a sweet, wonderful dog, and he really didn't deserve to be attacked the way he was. Um, he was raised with babies and kindness, and he he's just he shows that. Uh, the next day, this is the following day. Uh, I had been researching about how the city handles animal control issues, and I was surprised. Uh, that afternoon, 55 hours later, a sheriff came and talked to me and took my report. 55 hours. So it took 55 hours. Um, by that time, most of the evidence was not quite so visible on the ground. Patches of fur. Uh, it happened at 6.45 in the morning, so there was a very clear imprint of where my dog was drugged and pounded on um, in the ice from the grass. But of course, three days later, that was not there. So there were just, uh, I felt like I missed out on the opportunity to have the best evidence that I could have. So here we are, been going to meetings since December. Uh, on March 26th, Otis was posted on a Blue Lake community page. The poster called Bo City. It was a weekend. Um, called the sheriffs, and the sheriff said that Otis is not considered to be a threat. I would like to know how, and if that is really true that Otis is not a threat. Um, who determines this? 50 weeks before he attacked Handsome, he charged into my front door and I wrote it on Facebook. I wrote that he intimidated me because my animals and my small children. Whose job was it to take note and act appropriately to protect us, to prevent this from happening? What can we do now? Do we need a different protocol where it doesn't take 50 hours to get help? I think so. Thank you. So I'm not talking about a leash law. I'm very concerned about the aftercare for an emergency. I think that preventative is important, but I also feel that when it, there's an emergency, we need to have support for the victims. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. That's frightening for people who know and love others that love dogs, and particularly to know that there wasn't any disposition in the was still able to run around town. But I read both the ordinances that Blue Lake has currently. Um, this one is chapter 6.04 dog licensing and regulations, and they're very extensive. I mean, this is potentially dangerous and public nuisance dogs. And there are really clear procedures to follow for what to do in these kinds of cases. And we talk about who enforces, what needs to happen. Um, so probably having a subcommittee that wants to study these ordinances and see they're adequate. So, um, and looking at them quickly, to me, um, for the vicious dog, the attack on a human makes the dog vicious right away, and there is there are some immediate consequences. An attack on an animal requires two attacks before the, the dog is considered to be vicious, and I think maybe that could be a good place for a change. But anyway, there's a lot of, you know, like I said, the are pretty specific and detailed, and maybe the enforcement is no 
felt that maybe was the issue here. Um, and I don't know, I know in the past, um, I've sat on public safety commissions in years past, the uh, sheriff's department isn't necessarily clear on what the, our, our local ordinances are. Like I think what happened here, um, which not being able to respond until they talked to Mandy, the kind of situation where there might be some education and communication issues that could be looked at. Um, and maybe the ordinances in detail to see where they might be really not good, but good to have a, a situation because it's very serious and to apply that and see how would do we have adequate laws right now to protect other citizens, other dogs, and maybe prevent a situation like this from happening again. It's, they're pretty clear. Dogs cannot roam without their owner. And that's since the dog is roaming without its owner, then that part of the ordinance is not enforced right off the bat. So um, it might be a matter of looking at what we have and what needs to be done to make sure it works for to protect um, the animals and people in town. I think we've seen instances very serious about vicious animals um, attacking people. Other areas, I don't know if it's happening more frequently or being reported more frequently. But I believe I heard that the woman in Mexico may lose her arm as a result of a, a dog attack um, in the last month. So um, I think it's a good time to do that work and, and uh, make sure that our laws are being enforced to protect ourselves and our animals. Um, so we all feel safe in this town and see that our dogs are safe walking around. Thank you. Yes, Jean. Uh, I believe that the ordinance, if I remember right, um, says that the, the uh, dogs, have, if they're not on the leash, they have to be under the control of the owner. This obviously, this dog was obviously not under the control of the owner. Uh, so it kind of uh, negates the whole thing. There's no, there's no enforceable part this. Uh, there's no consequences. Something like this happened, and, and according to the ordinance, it's real vague on any consequences for damage that is done by a dog that is not on a leash or uh, under the control of the owner. Um, it, it could be um, a civil, civil matter, uh, but that's not why we're here. I, I was one of the ones that asked about the leash law uh, in Blue Lake. <coughs> Uh, which the ordinance does say the dogs can be under the control of the owner, but uh, maybe that needs to be changed. So dogs specifically need to be on a leash. We have a lot of uh, out of town dogs that are coming in. Sometimes they're lost dogs and they're wandering through. But uh, I've been around dogs uh, a long time, almost my life. And dogs are territorial. They bite. Uh, they snarl at each other. So uh, it seems the the um, the issue, just as a a small bit of what can be done, uh, is to address the leash law and whether that uh, under control of the owner should be uh, changed. Yes, Justin. Um, so I just witnessed um, uh, last week, literally right here at the doghouse, um, a lady walked a dog on her leash, and someone was visiting the doghouse, had a little dog there, didn't have it on a leash, and it ran at the, the dog on the leash, and the person was calling it, it wanted to go say hi that could have ended so much differently. I mean, no, it, it didn't end badly, but it very easily could have. I mean, it's like we're, you know, across the street from City Hall and that happens. I mean, I really feel like there, this should be looked at very strongly, at least some kind of leash law, some kind of punishment should your dog go out and attack someone else's dog. I don't know, legally speaking, there could be anything done there. In the civil matter, I don't know. But I really hope that your your ad hoc committee looks into if there is something that you guys can legislate, you know, in your 
your your law or the city law that can look at that. But I really do feel like something should be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Angela thank you. here. So um, I agree uh, with everyone that um, first off, uh, I appreciate you guys making an ad hoc committee and looking into the um, the vicious dog problem that we have um, and how we could better um, serve the public. Um, myself, uh, I've had a couple instances where I've taken, I don't take two dogs on on a walk at once, even though I have two leashes, even though I have that little connecting thing, I won't do it because um, so many times when I'm walking down to the river, there are people that have three dogs and there's no way one person can control their three dogs. Those three dogs come up to me and my one dog gets leashed. And uh, my dog, like it, it bit at the dog because it came into it's space. My dog was leashed. This dog that was not leashed. It, it came up with my dog, like, you know, acted like it was going to fight it. I don't want to put my dog in that position. Uh, it's, it's unfair. I can't tell you, every single time I have walked down to the river, there are people with dogs who do not have them under control verbally. And so, because people don't pay attention to the laws, because maybe there's no enforcement. I don't know why they don't pay attention. Um, me myself, I want to. I want my dog to be safe. Therefore, I have it on a leash just so that can happen. To it. But I can't tell you how many times I've had to pick my dog up, even when, I, when it was on a leash, because of the other dogs that are not leashed. So I would appreciate if you guys do, um, you know, find rules from somewhere else that we could apply here, or, you know, if we could take some type of action towards uh, protecting our dogs. Thank you. Okay. Lynn? Well, as Jean was saying, as you said right now, um, the ordinance requires that no dogs are allowed to run at large at any time, so it's always be under the immediate control of the owner. And then it authorizes the seizure and impounding of dogs found running at large. It also provides that the animal can be held to the extent possible for a very specific scope. So again, I think we're, the enforcement is going to be an issue. Um, what happens when that happens, and the, who, the public needs to know who to call, and, and whoever gets called needs to know what needs to happen, and all those kinds of things. And there may be other issues too, and maybe you want to add leash, you must be on a leash at all times too. But, um, but right now, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening. And it is, it's currently a lot. Okay. Yes, please. Thanks, Um. I just want to lend my support to the idea that um, a dog should be on a leash. Um, I know the idea of voice control. I've, I've heard that term quite a few times over the last uh, couple of years and certainly throughout this discussion. But I think voice control of 99% of dogs is a myth. Um, I've owned a lot of dogs in my life. I've been around a lot more dogs and I can and I and I I can I can't remember any dog that it wants to go somewhere the owner says, oh, no, and it stops and turns around and come back. I Maybe once in my life I've seen that. Boy, was I impressed because <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. So I think this voice control thing is absolutely a myth that we have to just be aware of that. Um, and every place I've ever lived until Blue Lake had a leash law. So I, I, I've assumed for the last 30 plus years that Blue Lake had a leash law. Um, and I guess I was wrong all that time. But um, but I think the leash law is not the exception, but to the general rule. So I don't imagine that we would have too much trouble um, switching over to that model. Um, so I'm definitely, definitely in favor of that. And um, and just you know, brainstorming different ways to talk about enforcement. You know, going back to what we used to have, where where public works um, employees here were trained and and deemed the dog catcher, and we had a facility to hold dogs here. Um, so it wasn't, uh, you know, a, a plea on Facebook at four o'clock or five o'clock saying, hey, we have this dog at City Hall. Can somebody take it overnight? Um, it's great that, that we're taking care of those animals, um, but City Hall and community members shouldn't have to worry about that. We should have a, you know, a couple of kennels maybe over at the corporation yard or something where a dog can be impounded overnight where it's safe and protected. And, um, and then we have just some, you know, some process 
where uh, the owners of those dogs can get them back. They have to pay a boarding fee or something if they've been kept. Um, you know, and we do a three strikes rule, or uh, you don't claim your dog, it goes to the, to the county shelter or something. Something where we, you know, we can develop. Um, I know there may be some, you know, some legal issues. I imagine we can work those out um, somehow. Um, but hopefully we can we can come up with a plan where there are there is some way to control these animals. There's a, a way to uh, to impose some sort of a fine or a fee for uh, for having to board those animals, and and we can you know build on that and create a safer environment where everybody can enjoy walking. People with and without dogs don't have to worry about going down to the river and having some big dog that might be frightening. <clears throat> Uh, to them, I mean, not everybody loves dogs, but every, but a lot of people, even the the non-dog lovers, want to be able to go for a walk and feel safe. So, um, so I think it's important that the city take an active role in making everybody feel safe, um, so that we can all enjoy the city and everything that we have to offer. Is the levy outside of the city limits? Mm, it's kind of quasi. It's, I wonder, um, like we have some shared long. responsibilities on the west side of the levy. Besides county side. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that for those of us that live uh, near the corporation yard, those days when the dogs got impounded there were a tremendous nuisance because those dogs barked constantly. So mm -hmm. they'd get put in those cages at 4 a.m. and we would hear it for the next yeah. 24 hours until somebody came and brought the dog in. Because people didn't come out get the dogs were in distress. So anyway, it's not so easy just throwing the cage in the corporation. People would have pets. I understand. Were they, was the kennel like outside or is it in a building? It was a, it was a cage, you know, okay. they, they had they had a dog house. I mean, it was, a, it was a very suitable and humane place to impound the dog. It just, the dog was in distress because it was a shame. cage. Well, the dogs <laughs> <laughs> happened many times. Scott Frazier, Blue Lake. It occurs to me that there's two separate things, and they're very distinctly separate things that we're discussing today. So I want to support the comments that Winona made, Winona made about she's not really addressing the leash law question. There was a very aggressive attack on a dog on her residence. So there have been other attacks recently in Trinidad. Mr. Ted Pease was written up quite well. I contacted Humboldt County Sheriff's because I was very interested in how that was being handled. And near the end, when they discharged the dog before the hearing back to the private owner, it was mishandled terribly. I think we're here tonight to ask you that we not have those kind of mishandling events in the future. So I want to address this as two separate items, the attacks. I think we should have our own ordinance. We should not follow Humboldt County's ordinance. They're currently reviewing theirs because of this recent attack in Trinidad. And there have been some others in the press recently. I personally, I'm a dog owner, have four Labradors. And of course, most people know that Labradors are very aggressive dogs, right? It's supposed to be funny, but I have had my Labrador scare a person who was jogging because the dog runs up to them to want to play with them, right? So, although the leash law thing comes up, but this idea about loose dogs and being under control, I believe we should have the ability for someone, some safety committee, some city, staff person to make a determination and it doesn't have to follow the vicious dog protocol that's currently in place with the county because that is problematic when it's a dog on dog attack and that's how Mr. Pease and his wife were both severely injured trying to stop a dog on dog attack and because it was a dog on dog attack initially none of the rules the Humboldt County had were adequate. I think we should be able depending on the severity of injuries to a pet or to a human be able to make that determination after one attack. And again, the, the reason the legal determination is important is because the dog can be destroyed. No one wants to see that happen, but we also don't want to see dogs considered personal property, but your, your, your pets, your loved ones, your family uh, attacks. So my first question on this is, was a citation issued to the owner of the dog that was roaming freely? And if not, why not? Because there need to be consequences. They shouldn't just be civil liability. Um, so let me go on to, to the leash part. Um, 
the reason that most ordinances talk about under control of the owner is there are other sorts of controls. I use e collars on four dogs. I do walk four dogs at a time and I carry four leashes. But the point is, it requires way too much good faith in today's world, as you acknowledged early on, that most people that are dog owners don't have control of their dogs most of the time. So it may be unfortunate, but we may need to have physical restraint on the dogs. But again, we also need to have enforcement. At the moment, that's not economical for the city of Blue Lake. So this question about whether it's the courtyard or some other place or contract with the county is something that should be thought about at the same time we're trying to figure out how we want these situations addressed in the future. But again, I encourage you to treat this as two totally separate issues because I think the idea is that we have a lot of people feel they only have themselves to rely on. It takes two or three days to get law enforcement to come out because we live in a small town. That's a good thing. We don't have law enforcement on the streets every day. That's actually a good thing. But not everyone's prepared to end a, a vicious dog attack either. So I give you that as, as uh, food for thought as you leave your, your committee room. Okay. One, one last thing sure. you committee could consider. I don't know, does it happen now that when you license your dog, you get a pamphlet about playing with the laws are in town or is there any kind of information that goes out to dog owners? Maybe you can answer this. Ah, uh, no. Okay. So that might be something else to, to fuel whatever you come up with and make sure the dog owners know what their responsibilities are. Um, regarding their own pets. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, if we want to, if you would like to, I just, I'd like to address any of the, uh, just get on the same page about the scope of the subcommittee. Is it a lease law thing? Is it an ordinance thing? Is it both? Um, kind of, so I can kind of drill down. Uh, from what I understand, the city council asked us to provide them with some feedback and possibility. And yes, I guess I'm not sure if that uh, possibilities to change the existing ordinances or possibilities about establishing a lease law or. or yes, I was looking back in the. Um, in my minutes and the council has asked the public safety commission to look into options for a leash law and to provide recommendations back to them for their consideration for a leash law mm -hmm. specifically yeah okay and what about the enforcement issues i thought we already had something in place that, um, as far as Vicious dog attacks. I thought animal control could. You do. So you have a pretty um, detailed ordinance, and that's something okay. that you guys could look at as part of the enforcement option um, to look at that language. Okay. When you say enforcement, do you mean enforcement of a leash law and then a penalty if it's not adhered to? Mm -hmm. Are those the same thing? Okay. Yeah, because it's the, um, since we contract with the county for law enforcement services, it would it would need to be codified so that they could actually um, either issue a citation or, you know, issue other or enforce other penalties. And so would only the sheriff's office be able to issue a citation? It depends on how, how it was written up. Um, we don't have animal control. Um, staff in town. So that's why the city has chosen to contract with the sheriff for enforcement. Okay. And uh, so does animal control staff mean, uh, is it a designation? Does it involve training or? Well, could, could, there could, could I be an animal officers. control officer? No, they, or, or does like, who, the how can you become one? Does it have to be a well, it's a sheriff or yeah. Okay. So the animal control officers work underneath the sheriff. Got it. Okay. I mean, I guess you could technically appoint someone as an animal control officer, but you have to have, I'm not sure what those uh, authorities would need to be to enforce. Um, I mean, you could, we, we talked about this with the attorney about issuing like like, could I go up and be like, your dog's off the leash, here's a ticket. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's 
it's really hard to enforce and you have to also provide remedies to cure. So by the time you go through the process of doing it, the cost to the city would be uh, extremely high versus, you know, you have to have a reasonable, uh, a reasonable fine. So, you know, $25. Uh, the, the ability to enforce that fine becomes very problematic for the city because you have to, they, you can go to, you have to go to court to enforce. So if someone wanted to, to basically, uh, you know, uh, dispute the, the, the penalty or the citation, then you go through a whole process of curing. And in the end, even if the city were to win, your remedies are basically to, um, you could file a lien, um, you know, for cost. But by that point, you, you're so many thousands of dollars into a very small, you know, uh, fine that it starts to really become problematic. So the attorney's recommendation was try to find some other means uh, to do this because the, the penalty side of it is just very, very difficult to enforce. So I can't go and be like, well, I'm gonna add it onto their water bill or I'm gonna, you know, there's, it's a, it's a process, it's a legal process that becomes very expensive. Okay, so if could we make a recommendation that the city council add that as a city function to issue a fine? You can, if that's your recommendation. But what I'm saying is that the ability to enforce that is is very problematic. But if we don't impose a penalty, then there's no reason for people to do it. I see what you're saying. As a well, the other side of it is you impose a penalty and everyone knows, people know that you can't enforce it. And so it's just the same situation. Yeah. You know, you have a, you have almost an unenforceable action at that point. Well, we have animal control officers. Right. That's their job to do that. We just need to work on the language so that they know what they can and can't do in the city. Um, and let make that clear that they're allowed to come in without the city's approval on a violent attack. You're you're whatever. you're misconstruing the situation. Okay. Council asked you guys to look at a leash law. Mm -hmm. Vicious dog is a totally separate situation that becomes starts to become a, a whole nother level of enforcement. So well, in that case, we're gonna go back to the very, initial item about items yeah. that aren't on the agenda. That's ridiculous interpretation. So what they've asked you to look at is enforcement of people walking through town with dogs on a leash because right now um, right now there's not an enforceable mechanism I mean people can say oh it's under my voice command and so that's the council would like you to look at options to make sure that people have to have their dog on a leash because having your dog on a leash is much more frontal than and being able to prove that you know, oh, my, the dog was under my voice command. That gets really problematic for any enforcement officer to be able to prove that. It's basically at that point of, you know, my word against yours, prove it. But if someone has a leash, that's, you know, or not a leash, that's a much more frontal enforceable act that a law enforcement officer can take action on. Okay. And one more question, sorry. So I understand that the initial ask is for the leash law, but what about the second part of it that's been brought up today? That's that not, not what council asked the PSC to review. Okay. So, so the council is addressing that at their level okay. already. Okay. So there's conversations taking place already. Uh, okay. So this is, they asked you, they've asked PSC to look at this as a specific situation. Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can clarify that a little bit more about um, how council is addressing that, that piece. I feel like I'm missing that. Uh, we'll have to take that up on another agenda item. That's not what the scope of this okay. item was. So Gee, could I, could I contribute just one little thing? So we're talking about um, if there was a citation, we wouldn't be able to, we don't have a, a mechanism to collect a fine. But what if we gave citations that were not, that had no financial penalty, but that, that they were really a record keeping mechanism? So like, you know, if, if dog number, you know, if Fido is out all the time and we know who Fido belongs to, we go to Fido's owner and we say, uh, you're getting a citation because Fido was in the park without you today. 
here you go. And that's a record that's kept at City Hall. And then it happens again the next day and the next day or the next week or the next month. So we have record of Fido being loose all the time. And so eventually maybe Fido is going to bite somebody. And then we have this record that Fido's loose a lot. So we have some, some record and we have some actionable, um, we have some evidence that makes, you know, the, the next stage, you know, more actionable. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it was known that Otis was out a lot. And then Otis caused damage, um, and it was, and so we would have some some uh, some trail, some paper trail, where we could say, okay, this isn't the first time we have a problem. We're gonna we can go to the next step. That kind of thing. Okay, we'll look. We'll note that. Yes, Jean. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, I was at the council when it was discussed about the lease law, and then I went into my brain went into, okay, well, what about enforcement? And then it goes off into another trail. So I was thinking, okay. So I was uh, thought <laughs> maybe um, a note to go on um, the city website um, and just say, uh, neighbors, could you please uh, be responsible neighbors with your, your animals, keep them on a leash. We've had some incidents uh, and, and just approach it that way, like a good neighbor policy of some sort. Uh, to let people know there is a problem and, and be respectful of, of people's space. Okay, that's noted. Thank you. All right, any last comments on this item before we move on? I think both of these laws are good to designate the venue violation infraction. Uh, according to the California Penal Code, an infraction is a minor violation that's not considered a crime. You can be fined up to two hundred fifty dollars, and which the point was how do you collect that fine, which is a good point. Um, maybe if you have a dog and you just want your dog back and you have a fine, that might be something worth looking at. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I would like to add one more little thing, okay. uh, if I may, that um, when uh, there were complaints about my dog being in its own backyard barking. Um, I live next to the mayor of my town and the a city attorney was hired to write a letter to me. So when it's needed, there is enforcement. So it just depends on the situation it seems because when, when we do wanna to talk to someone about their dog, we get the city attorney. I'm sure that cost them a bit of money. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move on to the next item. I'll thank you guys for your comments. We'll, we'll be presenting um, our findings to City Council at the next meeting. All right. So we're going to uh, move on to item six, the Community Safety and Preparedness Program update. Um, so this is our Sunday yeah, so uh, I've been talking with Andrew from Red Cross, and their time is finally starting to free up a little bit um, with all of the recent um, disasters and storms and earthquakes. Um, you guys all know that they've been severely um, inundated with you know, requests and um, trying to uh, manage resources and the communities that have been affected. Um, but it seems like they're starting to... Um, get a little bit of uh, time now. So I talked to Andrew about uh, end of May doing kind of our first uh, kickoff, our first community event. Um, he's got a couple of programs. He just did a smoke detector program. I think they picked one of the neighborhoods to start out with. They, uh, they did a pre-walk, letting people know they'd be coming through. I think they did on a Saturday morning. Uh, so they did like a Friday, they went and knocked on doors and let people know that they would be coming through on Saturday to offer services to um, help install smoke detectors and um, help inspect smoke detectors for anyone who needed assistance. Um, so that was that was a nice program that they had. They wanna to continue to um, move that out to the rest of the community. So we talked, that was one of the programs he had talked about originally, but I think we're looking at <clears throat> the, um, the program that they have to do kind of a basic home preparedness assessment and build a home preparedness kit or possibly do um, they kind of have a, their own disaster scenario that they can run um, that's 
kind of exciting um, and is helpful in getting people to start thinking about their own home uh, kind of situation and exits and how they, you know, inform their children or how they take care of their pets or uh, making sure that they have, you know, their checklists and medications and things. So uh, it's going to give me a little bit more information on that if that's scheduled. Did uh, they mention anything about CPT, uh, I mean, CPR or um, uh, first aid training? Yeah, so he does have kind of a community first aid training that they can do. It doesn't give you CPR certification, but it does, um, It do, it's, you know, kind of the, I mean, anyone can do CPR and you don't need to be certified to be able to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but it won't pass if you need CPR certification, say for a job or, or anything, but it's a great skill set to have. And so uh, that's one that they said they also could offer. So we tried to kind of line up a series. Uh, we, you know, we tried to start this months ago, but it just seemed like every, every time we turned around, there was just something else going on between yeah. earthquakes and yeah. um, everything. So everyone's been a little bit. First Sunday? Um, what are we talking about? No, it'll be the first time. I think we're going to go probably have to hit the end of the month. If he can do the end of May, or we'll have to start it in April. So. I'm just it's saying. just depending on what his availability is at this point okay. and what kind of trainers he has. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. Is there anybody that would like to speak on this item? Yeah, yes, go ahead. Kit, uh, Kit Man. And uh, as some of you know, I'm currently the lead of the uh, community emergency response team here in Illinois. Which is dwindling, sadly. And there are there are people in the audience and and people in town that you know can't make it to meetings, so they're still doing it. But we have some resources that we can bring to bear. In in you know we're really looking forward to doing a preparedness thing. Lynn and I are also very involved with the uh, neighborhood pod uh, program that Dot put together, and that's had a hard time getting traction, and certainly COVID made that you know stop. But one of the resources we do have in the CERT uh, equipment cache is we've got a dozen um, CPR antis. Um, so if there is a non-certified but CPR training, we've got some resources that can be brought to bear on that. And, and then just for you, I, I did put one together recently because they're still in boxes. Um, and it does have a little light that tells you if you're going too fast or too slow okay. or not getting deep enough. I mean, it, 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 we just went through a CPR training a couple of weeks ago. It takes some effort. Mm -hmm. and it's uh, really hard to get the rhythm right. Anyway, we've got some resources to bring to bear. Unfortunately, I haven't been gone the whole month of May, not back until June 6th or so, even for a couple of days. Um, but I'd love to be involved in it. Definitely. We've, we've definitely been talking about how we're involved in, yeah. in our events, so we'll keep you posted. Yeah. 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 I think uh, Jean had her hand up first. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I was uh, talking to uh, Andrew about the, the Red Cross and uh, such, and he did ask for people to maybe step up and, and volunteer for the Red Cross, and, and that's a good program. I did some training in that, and it's worthwhile. I'm getting older, and sometimes I, you know, I think maybe some things are just so yeah. much. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask about Crash Hall. Uh, uh, I asked about the designation of Crash Hall as, as an uh, emergency shelter, which I believe it is, but I just wanted to have that clarified. Is, is Crash Hall a, 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 an emergency shelter? It um, is designated as an emergency shelter. Um, Red Cross has some new um, contract language that we're working with them on, but the city has designated it as a Red Cross shelter and it's actively used by Red Cross when necessary. And something like this, an involvement for, for the um, community, um, could that involve uh, the hall, uh, crash hall, uh, at, at some point? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think we determined we were going to be using the hall at the fire department. Try to We're trying to bring more involvement with the fire department in the community. So. Oh, you mean have Red Cross at the fire hall? Yeah. Okay. But um, 
I, I just kind of got it kind of got lost in the shuffle. I, I, Andrew was saying that because of, of uh, some of the programs in the park that they are reluctant to use uh, crash halls because they don't want to interfere with the finances for the, the city of Blue Lake. But under emergency, uh, an emergency situation, I would assume that that would be clarified that the emergency situation would take priority, correct? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so what he's talking about is we've had times where they've needed um, facilities for clean air facilities. And because we run summer camp over there, that we were not able to accommodate it. Uh, we were able to accommodate the clean air facilities either at the Grange or at Skinner store. But to displace 50 children has a big impact on parents who are relying on crash or uh, child care so that they can work. And so the uh, Andrew, we were fine. We were able to facilitate the clean air shelters and other locations uh, because it's not just a financial impact, it's a huge impact to the parents having to try and reschedule. And that's usually at kind of a short notice when those facilities need to be up and running. Have we have we um, had any money change hands from the Red Cross for the facility? Is there anything involved with the uh, maybe upgrades or things that are needed? Or not at this Red time, Cross? but we've had upgrades through FEMA and through USDA. Yes, that we're working to on. be an emergency shelter. That's part of the reason that we're getting a commercial kitchen. Okay. Lynn. Is there any cost to the programs you're talking about with Red Cross? I mean, are these, is this particular program for individual families or the it wasn't clear on how that, was, how that would work? Are you talking about the neighborhood sort of walkthrough? And preparedness, and I guess Maddie was just talking about a program that would maybe put smoke detectors scenario and they could assess whether or not they're prepared to. I couldn't tell if that was for families. And then if they did the, um, First day training, was there any cost to that? Because usually I know they do charge per person. I, I believe we were we had talked about doing something like every Sunday, uh, the first Sunday or whatever at the fire hall, right? To so what we talked about was doing a monthly preparedness training yeah. for the community and doing it in connection with Red Cross and the fire department to kind of build a better uh, a stronger coalition of preparedness and responders. Um, so working with CERT, working with Red Cross, working with the fire department, working with Humboldt County OPS, to be able to bring resources to the community, to be able to do community specific trainings. Uh, these should be no cost trainings. These are things Red Cross normally offers in the community. Uh, and so that was kind of the goal is to, to help facilitate some of that conversation and also <clears throat> to hopefully get more information out about preparedness and also about emergency response and opportunities. Um, so as volunteer firefighters, we need more firefighters in our community. We need more CERT members. Um, so it's an opportunity to also disseminate information and let people know what services that we have in the community and where some of our gaps are. Yes. Uh, when I took the Red Cross training, it was at the fire hall, but I wasn't a CERT member, not a volunteer member, just a, a person going in and, and to uh, to learn about the, the procedures at Red Cross. And I received a certificate, which is not on record anymore. I, I'm sure it's still a long time ago. But I took three uh, classes, and then we did have uh, somebody come in and give a, a video about the, uh, the dam maybe collapse. And, uh, it's, it was pretty interesting, but I didn't have to be a, 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 a volunteer member or a CERT team member or any uh, group like that. I, I just went in as an individual. I think it was going to be open to the community. Uh, you don't have to be involved in a group. And we had various topics. It wasn't just first aid, right? We were talking about possibly like self-defense or things like that. Or... Yeah, we talked about a whole host of opportunities. Which, I mean, our goal was different... to have a one-year program. So each month we could have a yes. new topic. And that's through the fire department, right? Not, it's a no. collaboration just between the fire department. It was basically the PSC put it together and asked the fire department if we could use their facility to be able to host trainings there. And the fire department said, absolutely, that would be a great partnership. So 
um, mm -hmm. it originated out of this group to try and start doing more outreach in the community <clears throat> about disaster preparedness and what resources are available. Because in the event of a disaster, we literally are going to be sheltering in place in Blue Lake. And we will be relying on ourselves um, for services. And also, you would be the, uh, the mayor and um, uh, Blue Lake uh, would be the, uh, one of the coordinators for that one. Of the, and you, as the city manager, also play a large role in that, and the protocol, right? Yeah. So as we, I mean, part of those scenarios could be exercising our citywide emergency plan. Um, and that's part of the tabletop exercises that we've talked about as well. We'll talk, that's on the agenda tonight as well. Just very quickly, there is an individual, Brian uh, Brown, that did our, our uh, CPR first aid training uh, a couple of weeks ago that does free of charge. Okay. And uh, if you want the certification, you can pay for the certification, but that's the only thing charges. So somebody want if there are community members that want formal CPR, um, first aid, stop the bleed training, I, I have a contact for that. Okay. Any more um, questions on item six? We'll move along to item seven. Oh, actually, we're going to skip item seven because Andrew Bozier is not here tonight. And, um, so we'll go to item number eight, security patrol discussion. Yeah, so I was just going to give a quick check-in <clears throat> and let you guys know that I did meet with the sheriff um, to kind of talk about uh, the idea of having a security patrol. Um, and the I had two lieutenants out as part of that conversation. Um, they're both familiar with Pacific Coast and Pacific Coast security. Um, both said it didn't seem like it would be a problem. Uh, they worked well together. They've had experience working well together. Um, we talked a little bit about the upcoming contract negotiations. They didn't have any numbers yet, um, but those numbers should be coming out fairly soon to see what kind of cost increases we're going to be looking at. Um, I did ask them what their thoughts were about um, using a security patrol group and then just having a basic contract with the sheriff to be able to provide uh, major crimes um, and arresting capabilities, but not the patrol side of things and what kind of that cost reduction might look like. So uh, they were still working on kind of looking, looking at that and seeing what those numbers could look like. So. Um, it's just going to be an ongoing conversation for a little bit until we have something that's um, more tangible to be able to present. <laughs> okay. Is your time frame full? Um, I don't. I mean, they're they're working. On, everyone's working on budgets right now, and everyone's backing into numbers. So um, Trinidad's asking the same question at this point as well. So hopefully, we'll have some information. Will we expect an update from the pilot program in Trinidad? From so they haven't started yet. Oh. Yeah. So they're still doing kind of the same thing. Um, at number of hours, looking at the numbers, the costs. Um, so I don't have any information from them as well. Okay. Are there any comments from the public for this item? All right. We'll move on to item number nine, the tabletop exercise discussion and update. <clears throat> Did we, so where, I guess where were we at? When, yeah, so um, I just, uh, heard back from Ryan Derby with Humboldt County OES, and he is available to talk, um, I believe it's on Wednesday. Um, we kind of have a standing OA meeting um, that's now being transitioned, so we're going to use that same time to talk about this. He says, um, super excited, would love to help with this, has a lot of um, information and experience with tabletops, and so We'll get some more details on Wednesday on kind of, I did send him kind of what the scenario was that um, the PSC is interested in, in uh, exercising and he thought that was great and I should have a deeper dialogue on Wednesday and be able to report back to you guys. And we're, okay. are we still working on earthquake? Yeah. Okay. And we're going to, and we're, are we uh, still partnering, partnering with anybody or are we, I mean, we're we inviting CERT to be involved in this, of course, in the school and yeah, so All this would be a Blue Lake specific um, disaster. So 
we would be exercising this with all of the response partners and you know obviously the school and um, the city public works um, cert fire there won't be a lot of us but there will be <laughs> it'll be good it's a, i think it's a really good scenario i think there's a lot of ways like i said we can exercise a lot of different um, aspects of our emergency plan with that scenario yeah, man, what's the uh, expected timing here? Well, we've been trying to get this going for a long time, but we seem to just keep running into disasters and emergencies. Yeah, so all of awesome. our, yeah, so all of our um, OAS partners are have been a little bit inundated. So it seems like now's a good time. As long as we don't go straight into wildfire season, we should have a nice little break. So I'm hoping to capture. Uh, I've asked County OES uh, Ryan Kirby to come and help facilitate it. Um, and just kind of help us about an evaluator. Um, so he, we're going to talk on Wednesday to see kind of what timeframes they have. But this is a pretty basic scenario, and I don't think it'll be too complicated to put together. So my only request is make it after, after June, June 6th. <laughs> June 6th. Or 7th, maybe. I'm not sure. We I thought they we talked we talked about them being on the list, yeah. But they'll be invited on whether they'll participate or not, I'm not sure. Anybody else? Okay. Um so the public safety work plan discussion. Um you guys all have a new work plan. Uh, we're just kind of chipping away at this as we go. Uh, we do have wildfire season coming potentially here um, any day now. So um, one of the items was to work with resource agencies in the city on wildfire preparedness issues, um, including specific objectives identified by the city's hazard mitigation plan and the community wildfire protection plan. And I think that along with this, we had talked about some outreach to okay, people preparing their properties being their gutters, that kind of thing, just reminders to the community, things they should be doing. Um, I think part of that was the PSAs. And I don't know, I think Stephanie, you were going to bring back a list of PSAs at some point. Yes. Um, we, I will have that. Um, I wasn't sure if I should bring that to this meeting or it was, should, and it should be part of the agenda or it should be a separate sort of presentation. You could either for the next time you could need to be added to the agenda to discuss or well it's part of it's part of your work plan. Part of the work so okay. Just said yeah. So okay. so next to work plan discussion, yep. it'll okay. uh, have you done your presentation. Okay. On the uh, work plan, I'm interested. You mentioned that you were involved in the pod type approach. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get with you. And I was too. I wasn't sure how to approach people. It doesn't sound like you've had much success. No, we have. We, okay. we do have an active pod. We're one of the okay. three active pods in the Fantastic. Region. My pod's very active. Oh, great. Yeah, they, they do have Maybe I'm in your, I might be in your yeah. pod. <laughs> it, is, it, is, and it, is, it is on our work plan to promote pods yeah. um, as part of the community outreach and empowerment. Yeah. So um, I, we, we're very supportive of pods. Um, you know, we, I think, personally, I think they were great. And um, we, we've tried with Neighborhood Watch, but it seems like the program's a little antiquated and we're having issues getting that off the ground. But, um, you know, uh, we, we'd like to work more with getting pods. Actually, it's, yeah, it's right here. So part of our plan. Yeah. So. We are, we are talking about a, a, for our annual meeting, possibly doing a tabling event kind of thing. Um, so we, we just to, to lead on that for any Mary Day Circle have a table and there will be a, a pod uh, contingent there as well. Okay. So we'll be looking for those people and trying to get them. Yeah. Work plan. Yeah. 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 Ye
we're trying to. <laughs> because we know if there's a pod, CERT and the fire department and everybody else will have less work to do. Right. So that was, the, that was actually the next item uh, we're going to talk about. Um, and then pursue ongoing training, uh, which we just talked about for the community. Um, encourage and promote neighborhood watch programs. Um, you know, we, we have had, we've been doing that in the past. But, um, so uh, we just talked about the tabletop exercise and that's moving forward. Uh, and then community empowerment, um, so update the public safety brochure. We talked about that in the last meeting. Uh, meet with individual neighborhoods to assess their area specific concerns. Um, you know, we, in the past, we have been going out and putting flyers out on door hangers on people's doors, inviting them, specific neighborhoods at a time, to the next meeting. Um, we did that for many months and got one person. So well, we kind of, um, you know, we don't know if that was being very effective, so we kind of laid off on that for a while. Um, that's all I had on work plan, unless anybody had it, anything else? Um, so we don't really have anybody here for agency check-in um, for the sheriff's department or the fire department. So there's not a lot of news going on. Um, Are you guys all receiving the control stats? Yeah. Yes. Um, and anybody in the community is, I posted it on Facebook page uh, this morning. But anybody is welcome to use the Citizen RIMS uh, site with the Sheriff's Department um, and get real up to date stats on what's going on. on this is Citizen what? Is it Citizen called? RIMS, R I M S. So it's on the county, it's on the Sheriff's Department's page. Um, <clears throat> and then you can go on there, and there's, it's an a interactive map. It'll show you place markers of where calls were at, and you can click on it and it tells you what it was and that kind of stuff. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> is that do they update that update that in real time? I believe so. Yeah, it's very very so quick. So if you're wondering why there's a whole bunch of cars, sheriff's cars somewhere, you can find that. No, oh, I don't know if it's that real time. Uh, yeah. I, I looked at it the next day. Yeah. Right now, and they have, you can they, see like layers. You know, they have to like actually fill out their report and submit their report before it gets entered in okay. to the thing, but. Uh, um, okay, so moving on to reports from um, liaison and staff. We don't have our liaison here today. He's just getting up to speed, I believe, on, on the, being our new liaison. So um, we'll hand it over to Mandy for some new updates on what's going on. Yeah, so um, we're moving into uh, spring, and eventually in summer we'll be here really quickly. So that means a lot of events in town. Um, a lot of activities, um, kids will be out of school. Um, just thinking about, we had a, a May Day event over the weekend that was that was great, and it, you know, but it just shows like how many people will come out for events in Blue Lake, and it's just going to continue to grow. So, um, just thinking about safety concerns uh, around those types of activities and events. Um, We'll be running summer camp. We're already getting geared up for that. Um, that brings a lot of kids out to our parks, uh, lots of families coming out. Uh, we are continuing to work on the Greenwood Road Improvement Project. Um, that is a fairly substantial project. It's $1.6 million uh, to improve Greenwood. That's going to put in a lot of uh, improvements to enhance safety, slow down traffic, sidewalks bigger. I think it's going to be a really great project and I'm really excited um, to see some real infrastructure improvements to physically slow people down. Uh, it's probably our biggest concern is just people speeding through town. <clears throat> In fact, today I called two companies to report people um, speeding through town uh, while kids were being dropped off. So it's a continual problem that happens daily and um, I'm hoping that the improvements will force people to, to not be able to drive so fast. Um, Sam's trying to think what other projects we have going on. 
we just have a lot of activity in the parks right now, which is great, uh, but it's, it does create a lot of congestion and a lot of different intersects of user groups. Um, so just making sure that the public's aware, making sure our kids are aware, people are aware that you know this is a one-way street. We've got lots of little ones running back and forth between games and practices and you know just trying to, um, to be aware of our surroundings, I guess. So um, I don't really have anything out of what. Oh, the Bottawat. So the Bottawat Community Project is moving forward. Um, I'm really excited to see how it's coming together. It'll be going to the May, the May Planning Commission meeting. Um, it is, it's gone through all of its iterations, special studies reports. Um, uh, we just met with the fire department last week to get their final comments on the plan. So that was really good. Um, working with Ed Laidlaw from Arcata Fire, he's the Arcata Fire Marshal, and it's who Blue Lake contracts with um, to get their comments, and um, we'll be incorporating all of those into the final report. Um, Arts and Heritage is doing a lot of work on that project, too, just looking at aesthetically um, what can be added or um, improved upon to make, to make it a really pleasing uh, addition to the Powers Creek District. Um, the bike park is moving forward. We were really hoping that we were going to be breaking ground on that soon, but the weather keeps keeps impacting us, and so we really need it to be dry for a while. So because we need to move dirt, and um, so eventually we'll be moving dirt for the bike park. So that's exciting too. Um, lots of concerns around traffic safety um, for the new development down there. That's a pretty much a speedway right now, but I think. The new project is going to bring a lot of improvements. Um, it's being heavily considered on how to slow traffic down and, and make that a much more walkable and enjoyable um, place for people to circulate. So yeah, uh, the Russo project is also coming to the Planning Commission in May. Um, that's a second phase project that will add additional development in the Powers Creek District. So it's really exciting to see them. You know, it's a, a nice young family from Blue Lake um, investing back in their community. And I think that development is going to be really nice as well. Um, I think that's about road repaving. Road repaving. Good <laughs> God, Stephanie, you're on it tonight. Uh, road repaving, that is supposed to be starting this month. We just did a full city walkthrough with Mercer Frazier. That's the contractor who was awarded through pg &E. Um, there's going to be a lot of paving in Blue Lake. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I think we're going to get, you know, it's been, it's been a struggle with all of the work being done, but, you know, having safe gas lines and then getting our streets repaved, I think is going to be a huge benefit. Um, the city gets very, very little money for streets each year. So basically we get enough money to hopefully just fill potholes, but we never get any repaving money unless it's part of a larger project. So um, we're really hoping that we can make some more substantial improvements up in Phil's neck of the woods, up at Northfield Terrace especially. Um, that's been a, that's historically that was a very poorly developed um, road system up there. And so it's something that the city struggled with for years trying to figure out how we fix that. Um, so I'm hoping that this project, I was very excited to see them continually just tear up that road and make bigger intersections because they're going to have to replace all of that. So uh, we're we're keeping our fingers crossed that we can make some substantial improvements around town. Are they get, oh, I'm sorry. You are they going to do this kind of in a systematic way? Because I know the gas line stuff, you never knew where they were going to be. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm assuming that they're they have a route. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what that route's going to look like or where they're going to start first. Is there a time for the project? Um, I believe we need to wait for it to stop raining. Um, that's been a big problem. Like every spring right now is popping up. Um, we can't, there's no sense paving until our water table goes down because it just will not hold. So, and there's going to be a lot of excavation that they have to do too. I mean, they're not just going to go and like fill a pothole and roll it. I mean, they have to dig out, they've got to put base, they've got to slurry, be backfill a lot of trenches and things. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that comes with it. And this includes sidewalks too, right? They'll be doing the sidewalk repairs too. And then whatever damage there, I know some people had things in their backyards that 
<clears throat> that they need to fix so they'll their their full recovery team will be coming out. All of us are breaking? No. Oh, anything else on Powers Creek? I think that's about it. Item 13, future agenda items. Um, Jason, just a oh, yeah, quick ahead. comment. You know, listening to Mandy talk and realizing how much, how many more activities are coming to Blue Lake and people are coming to Blue Lake. And um, the CERT has been called upon numerous times to provide traffic management. We've just learned in our traffic management course that we can't call it traffic control because that implies that we have any kind of authority. We don't have authority to try and direct people. But anyway, it occurred to me that maybe we could, the city could create a traffic management volunteer core, not to serve, but, but you know, have a few other community members in there so that as all these events begin to unfold, we can call on somebody to come down on Little League Day and Softball Day and slow people down over here. Just, you know, anyway, just an idea to develop a volunteer core. Of future agenda items, um, if they just have uh, our normal the tabletop exercise, um, <clears throat> I'll have um, the PSC list. Okay, PSC presentation. Yeah. Uh, for the work plan. For um, the work plan and the, and the community safety plan. Okay. Um, and then we'll have a um, an update on the. The subcommittee for the dog uh, leash law. Um, and I think that's all I have for the future agenda items so for our normal agency check ins and work plan discussion. <clears throat> so, okay, so if there's, if there's no objections, we will now take a uh, um, <clears throat> what's that? Motion to adjourn. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got struck up. I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Um, I'll second. So, are there any objections? All right. Hearing no objections, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.